Um, so yes, I'm here to talk um, to you about the start of our project on mapping public access to green infrastructure. Uh, and a particularly interesting part of that project for me. So I work in geographical information systems. I work with um, a variety of spatial data. Um, one of my key interests as a researcher is in thinking about the um, benefits that we get from the natural environment. So connecting some of the environmental data that we have to our natural assets and actually creating inventories to describe the spatial distribution of some of our um, precious resources and how that connects to our um, health and well-being. So let's start with thinking about what is green infrastructure. That's a, a nice place to start. Well, we can think about, um, you know, looking out the window, if we had any windows here, look out a window and you see green infrastructure. It's those elements of the natural and semi-natural environment that connect our urban and rural spaces together. They provide a huge benefit for um, creating sustainable communities. They provide benefits to our health and to our well-being. They exist in a wide variety of different forms. So you might have very urbanized spaces, sort of elements of urban greening, um, green spaces surrounding sort of car parks, connecting our buildings. So very small pockets of uh, green spaces to much larger um, areas of green space. And we're con concerned about that network and having that um, general provision of a green infrastructure all around us. So our project's aim really um, was to think about trying to collate some of this spatial data. So you've seen a photograph of what green infrastructure looks like. We've been out there and touched it. How do we get that data into the computer and how do we work with that data and start to quantify that data to be used possibly for planning purposes and other uh, reason, reasons. We found that a lot of local authorities actually hold a variety of information on their own green infrastructure, but that information is quite disparate. Okay? Different local authorities have different ways of recording green infrastructure. We wanted something that would work on a regional basis. So we started off thinking, okay, let's look at the eastern region, let's look at um, Norfolk, Suffolk and Essex, what, are the, what sort of green infrastructure do we have there? How do we quantify it? How do we pull all that together? A lot of the information that was held by these local authorities hasn't been updated for a while, so it was a big push as part of the planning public policy guidance to have this information in place. But how are councils being able to update that and what is the, the sort of relative priority of that update information like? So we wanted to get consistent data uh, and something that we could use across a region. One of the things we started to look at was addressing this data challenge by looking at open data sources. So we've heard a lot about access to, to data and the difficulties of retrieving data. So what happens if we take a step back and actually think about um, publicly accessible data and what we could do with that? So one example of that would be open source data, something like volunteer geographical information. And a prime example of this is something like OpenStreetMap. Okay, so if you looked at Google Maps, it's very similar to that sort of platform, but it's actually volunteer geographic information. It's information that's contributed by the public. They upload their information on their local area which means that it's, it can be rapidly updated, it can incorporate a lot of local knowledge, and crucially, it can incorporate a lot of attributes, a lot of additional information that we wouldn't get through proprietary mapping. So, for example, some of the ordnance survey data doesn't have the full range of attributes or the full range of information that we could get out of something like OpenStreetMap. This is what OpenStreetMap um, looks like. There are a few caveats associated with using OpenStreetMap. As I said, it's volunteer geographical information. The pe people contribute their information on particular pockets, say, of um, green space, 
but they use their own ways of describing that pocket. So we might take a park, for example. Different people might delineate slightly different boundaries. You might have different ways of describing that due to the functions that that park plays. You might describe it in terms of its form, so in terms of it having grass, trees, um, different types of vegetation, whether it's got a playing field associated with it. So there's lots of information that we can pull out of these pockets of green space by using this data, which has both its pros and its cons associated with it. Another thing that you could probably see from this um, image here, we've got part of the central Norwich Ring Road going down the middle of this map here. Uh, to the south of that, we've got highly detailed information on individual buildings. To the north of that line, we've got far fewer information on those those buildings, and that's indicative of different layers of coverage, so different things being picked out by different people. So the, there's a lack of consistency sometimes in the amount of um, information that we have been um, that has been available through this data source. So we have to bear these issues in mind when we're using this open source database. So what we decided to do, bearing this in mind, was actually to make use of one of our most valuable assets that the university uses and that a lot of local authorities also use, which is an ordnance survey data product, which is MasterMap, which is over on the top right-hand side of that. And what we did was we tried to get the both of best worlds. So we tried to combine that ordnance survey MasterMap data with extra information from OpenStreetMap for example, to give us extra information on those attributes. So to give us extra information on rather a pocket of land being just natural, um, we could actually use OpenStreetMap to query what um, type of natural land that was. So we pulled together those data sources, extracted elements of green infrastructure from both. In some cases, we'd have um, areas of land that would overlap, so we'd get consistency, and in some cases we'd get features that were only represented by one um, data set and um, only some by the other data set. Together, this produced our re regional green infrastructure map, something that we refer to as this open street map, an ordnance survey blended data set. In a visual form, it looks something like this. So you've got the OpenStreetMap data on the far left, um, then our master map data in the middle, a bit more detailed, a bit more, um, arguably more spatially accurate to produce this blended data set that we've been um, testing and working forwards using. So an example then, um, where is Norwich? green infrastructure from the University of East Anglia in Norwich. Um, so where is our green infrastructure? What you can see at the moment is a footprint of, of Norwich. No green infrastructure to be seen on here. We've got the road networks and we've got the building footprints. What I can then do is add on um, the information from this blended data set. And now you can see um, different categories of green infrastructure. So we tried as well to, to forward think how we're classifying green infrastructure. And that's another issue with bringing in data sets from different um, data sources in that people will describe things in different ways. They have different original purposes to these data sets and we're using them in a slightly different way. So we came up with our um, own definition. It was actually based on some other work that we were doing with DEFRA and Natural England. Um, to actually um, think about um, the benefits that these different types of green infrastructure provide. So this is a way of grouping those elements of green infrastructure. Now there are certain um, filtration processes that we then need to go through. Uh, if we're thinking about public access to green infrastructure, you can see just to the north of the city there, there's a nice yellow packet um, of green infrastructure labelled um, a productive space and um, that's actually the airfield of Norwich Airport so that arguably needs to be removed if we're only looking at um, public access to green infrastructure so you need to be um, quite forward thinking and think about the fitness for purpose of these data sets. <coughs> 
What about different data sets, different ways of defining green infrastructure? We could look at something like the Ordnance Survey Open Green Space Map. So this was released in July 2017. This was after we started our project. Um, and you can see that the um, extent of this green infrastructure is defined by um, the Ordnance Survey Open product is quite less than what um, we were getting from our pooled data set. So here we're only looking at five of those classes that I showed you before. We're losing that some of those productive spaces. And we're really concentrating on those public areas, access areas. But we're also finding that we're not picking up some of the uh, areas that we knew about locally as well that should have been on that map. So the Ordnance Survey Open Green Space products was a great product, um, but possibly not uh, as useful as our product on a local scale. Again, more recently, um, we've been looking at a different product from the Ordnance Survey. This is now proprietary data, which is taking that master map data set, which we have been using, and the Ordnance Survey developed their own classification of green space sort of in parallel to ours. And then what I've tried to do is to then fit our classification back on their proprietary data set and, and see um, how well they, they match up. Um, you can see probably the airport is pick, picked out a lot better in this image here, just not to the north of the city. And now it's classified as urban greening. So again, we need to think a little bit about um, the fitness of these various classifications. You can also see from this map, although it's quite detailed, we're missing areas in the rural communities. So the Ordnance Survey Master Map Green Space product at the moment concentrates on uh, urban green space, um, those elements of urban green infrastructure. So we haven't found a product that, that fits all. Um, a single product that fits all. We need to think a bit more about how we're combining our data sets. So thinking a little bit about the differing coverage then of these different data sets, we've got the green infrastructure from um, the Ordnance Survey Open product um, on the far left here. And that covers about 2% of that, that region that we're talking about. So, so that's Norfolk, Suffolk, and Essex. Only about 2% of the region is covered by that product. It increases to about 20% with our um, blended product in the middle here. And if we use an alternative definition of green infrastructure, so if we use something completely different now and we think about defining green infrastructure on uh, the basis of land cover, so we're reclassifying the Korean database, um, satellite da data, we actually find that um, we're getting about 12% coverage with that data set. But we do have a good consistency, a good correlation between our blended data set and what's coming out with the, um, with the land cover-based definition. So those two, that middle and that far right diagram, the, the correlation between those two data sets is roughly 0.7, so that's a strong relationship there. So we're picking out most of that green infrastructure. So I said that we were getting some agreement from our Ordnance Survey master map um, data set layers. So this is thinking about this blended data set that we've been working on. So we've got some features coming out only from Ordnance Survey master map, and we're getting some features only taken out from the OpenStreetMap, and we've got agreement in about 45% of cases. So what's happening in terms of um, where we're getting differences between these data sets? Where are they not agreeing? We can find that um, some of the differences, particularly with the OpenStreetMap data set, so where OpenStreetMap is arguably um, picking out those green elements of green infrastructure better that correlates strongly with where people are. So where we've got these urban areas, we're finding that people are, are surveying them um, more effectively and we're getting that reflected in the amount of green infrastructure that's being pulled out. So we're getting these peaks. Um, you can see Norwich there and in South Essex. 
So taking that, that train of thought a little bit further, um, thinking about the relationships between where these data are coming from and how they're originating um, and what the, the characteristics of these areas are like, we decided to look at um, some socioeconomic associations. So we were thinking about here the relationship between um, population density and the, as a representation of urbanisation and um, the amount of green infrastructure that's been picked out by these different services. So this is all a reflection of um, the amount of coverage, so the amount of green infrastructure, that the quantity of green infrastructure that we're getting here. And we can see quite a strong relationship, especially with that Ordnance Survey Open Green Space product and with the blended master map data set. Also, if we have a look at the um, bottom row here, um, we can think about those areas where the open street map is actually picking out things that master map isn't. So where is open street map picking out green infrastructure that the ordnance survey haven't picked it out? Um, that seems to be strongly correlated with um, those less deprived areas. So we've got the index of multiple deprivation that data there, IMD data, um, as we um, decrease the um, deprivation scores, particularly with relevance to education, as you can see as an indicator, um, we see that um, we're getting more um, open street map data um, into this green infrastructure map. So those um, more highly educated among us um, and in um, urban settings are contributing more to these green infrastructure map in um, this blended data set. And that's just something that we need to bear in mind if we're using this um, data set going forwards. Um, where this data set has, has come from and the potential caveats going forward um, using this. At the moment, we're looking at um, different ways of defining green infrastructure still with these data sets. Andrew's going to talk to you a little bit later about um, some of the current work that we've got going on. In parallel to that, I'm looking at other data sources and I'm trying to quantify some of these relationships and trying to get to, to, to grips with the consequences of using these different data sets. Yeah, so um, as Andrew said, uh, my name is Mandy Burke. I work in um, Norwich Medical School. Um, and along with uh, Andy Jones, who's a professor in public health, I've been looking at a project um, to measure rural disadvantage using Norfolk as a case study. So this project came about um, in discussion um, with Andy and Rashmi Shukla of Public Health England, who has a lead there for uh, rural health. Um, there's been um, a long-standing feeling that uh, rural areas are underrepresented in um, multiple deprivation indices, and there's been a little bit of work um, already on this. Uh, looking at the literature, the two main uh, areas or issues are that uh, rural deprivation is thought to occur in small pockets amid relevant, uh, relative affluence. So where you, when you're taking an area-based measure, so... Um, proportions or averages, um, that's cancelled out. That's the first issue. Um, the second possible issue is that the uh, characteristics of rural and urban deprivation may differ. So, um, for example, uh, air traffic pollution might not be such an issue in country areas. Um, on the other hand, distance to um, services might be. So our task is to, or was to, develop an index of rural deprivation using Norfolk as a case study and with an emphasis on health. So um, here's some uh, images from Norfolk. And um, on, your, on your left, that's right, um, on your left you'll see a typical um, image from Norfolk um, with a wind pump, water, uh, no, no hills, um, and uh, 
these places do exist. There's lots of them, and they're very lovely. Um, another image of rural Norfolk on your top right. Um, that's in a village where I used to live. It's a row of council housing built in the 1960s for people over 60. And it's really lovely. It's an idyllic setting. Um, but when I used to live there in that village, um, when I first came to Norfolk, um, we, I was a student, or my partner was a student. I was working part-time, and we couldn't afford a car. And um, there were only a few buses a day. And the last bus back was 6 o'clock. And um, my working hours ended at 6 o'clock. So I either needed to leave work early and rush across Norwich to get a bus, or I had to cycle, um, which isn't much fun uh, in the dark along a narrow country road with shop shopping bags on your handlebars. So there, it is an Id idyllic situation, but if you're poor, um, in bad health, or vulnerable in other ways, there are real issues with getting to services. Um, particularly with the increase of car ownership, which has meant village shops and other services have decreased. The final picture is uh, near where I live now, and it's on the coast. Um, it's near a very small holiday destination, and it's an abandoned holiday village, um, I assume from the 50s, looking at the buildings. Um, so it's... Uh, it's, um, it's in an area of high, of high deprivation, um, bordering um, Great Yarmouth. So, um, there is an existing measure of multiple deprivation. The, um, it's an official statistic it's called the Index of Multiple Deprivation. Can't we use this? Can we reweight that? The IMD has seven domains. Um, you can see them illustrated by the, the seven colours on the, on the chart. Um, they're really topics, if you like. So you have employment, income, crime. These seven domains, they're combined into the, the index. Um, prior to being combined, they're weighted. So, um, and some domains have more of higher weighting than others. So um, the highest weighted domains are employment and income, and they're just under 50% of the total weighting. Those domains are um, measured purely on benefit uptake, not on any other type of um, indicator. And within the IMD, um, they've attempted to use predominantly um, administrative data rather than census data or um, other survey data. And that's just because it's, it's normally more up to date. Um, having said that, some of the domains do contain census and other survey data. So this chart shows um, the seven domains across five types of urban rural classification. They're the five that apply to Norfolk. From your um, left, I don't know my left from my right, you might have gathered, but from the left, um, that's the most urban um, type of classification within Norfolk. So that's urban city and town. Um, moving towards the right is rural town and fringe. Then you have rural town and fringe in a sparse setting. So this is isolated rural town and fringe. They're small t rural towns, basically. Then you have what you typically describe as countryside, rural village and dispersed, and then rural village and dispersed sparse. So um, you can see where the orange circles are, that while a lot of the domains are pretty stable across those different classifications, um, for the uh, rural village and dispersed, there's two domains um, where the bars are quite low. And this is ranks, where rank one is the most deprived or disadvantaged. So the, those two uh, domains are barriers to housing and services and living environment. So can we do anything with those two domains? Within those domains, you have two subdomains. Um, so in barriers of, to housing and services, you have geographic barriers and wider barriers. And they, um, one of those is more relevant to rural areas, and one is more relevant to urban areas, yet they're combined into one domain. So ge geographic barriers is essentially distance to services, measured by time, by distance, sorry. 
And um, wider barriers is housing overcrowding, which tends to be an urban issue. Homelessness, also an urban issue. And in Norfolk, um, housing affordability is about even across both rural and urban areas as a whole, although some areas it's an issue where there's second home ownership. Living environment, um, indoors living environment, um, uh, uh, rural areas score poorly on this and more disadvantaged, largely due to um, issues of central heating and being far from gas uh, connections. Um, outdoor living environment is air pollution and road traffic accidents um, and more applicable to urban areas. So the f what are the first steps in creating our RDI? Um, what we decided to do is, um, is group um, the indicators we hope to put in um, using theoretical dimensions of deprivation. So while the IMD has seven domains, we looked at what, what we felt under, underlay these domains and how the indicators within them might be grouped. Um, our first domain is relative household deprivation. So these are all um, the indicators that remain relatively stable across the different um, classifications. They're highly correlated to each other. Um, for example, income and employment extremely, I think the correlation coefficient is 0.9. So changing one of these or the relative weighting of one of these to the other is not likely to make a huge difference to the final outcome. So we group them together. And then bearing in mind that we're looking for an index that measures a specific type of deprivation in a specific area, we're not trying to be fair and measure um, deprivation across all, all areas in, the, in England, we created a second um, dimension which was where we're going to put factors related to the locality, in this case, rurality. So in that, um, in that dimension, we'll put things like distance to services, but we're dropping things like air pollution because they're not, they're not actually that relevant to people living in rural areas uh, normally. So what else? Um, we put in a third uh, dimension. Um, and this is because the IMD measures relative deprivation. So sometimes this equates to prevalence and sometimes not. So for example, um, we were looking at doing a needs assessment for a project called SAIL, which is aimed at older people um, uh, who are disadvantaged. It's a physical activity uh, intervention. And uh, we looked at a, sub um, a supplementary um, index uh, attached to the indices of multiple deprivation, older people income deprived. And what we found in Norfolk, that some LSOAs, which are little geographic areas, are highly deprived on this measure, but they have very few older people income deprived. And that's because they're young LSOAs, because what they're doing is they're measuring the proportion of older people that are depri income deprived. If you have a very young LSOA, that's not many people. So um, this matters when you're trying to target your interventions. Another example is, um, as is normal, health measures are age standardized. That's how you compare, can compare like with like. So an LSOA with an older population might be less um, health deprived the one with the younger population that has more people with health problems. So it's not necessarily, it's not wrong, it's just you need to understand that and be able to um, deal with it when you're dealing with a particular population. So we added a third dimension, which is population characteristics, um, because rural populations tend to be older. Okay, so what about the pockets? Um, I mentioned small pockets of um, deprivation um, earlier on um, that uh, hypothesized to um, be relevant to rural deprivation. We created a new, very simple measure to look at variability within LSOAs, the small geographic areas. And this uses the range of scores uh, from the census. So the census is measured in OAs, and not much else is measured in OAs. They're really small geographic areas. So we, there are about six OAs in most LSOAs. So we took self-reported poor health, and we looked at the range of scores um, for, each, for the OAs within the LSOAs, and adjusted it a bit, and um, come up with the variability index. So we've included this as our fourth possible dimension in our index. Um, 
So um, the indicators. We um, initially started, actually, by looking mostly at what indicators we were going to put in. That was almost our, our, our first thoughts. Um, and looking th through the literature, what we realized is something that um, a lot of other um, people had done. Um, but what, what happens, uh, so there's been a number of rural deprivation indices um, developed. What tends to happen is very specific local type data goes in. So it's quite difficult to transfer the model to other areas. So although we started looking at um, what data we were going to put in and explored local data, we um, got data from the Citizens Advice Bureau, um, from Norfolk County Council, um, from Sustrans on, tra on transport poverty. What we ended up deciding is we would look at the structure and look at putting in publicly available data into this structure um, with the idea that it could be supplemented at a, local, uh, at a local level, if necessary, by additional data. We did use one type of local data to test, to test the model, which I'll talk about in a little while. So um, what went in was largely from the IMD. So in relative deprivation, it's income, employment, education, health and disability domains. Um, Locality-related deprivation, we used to travel time rather than distance and included public transport and cycling and walking. And we used housing and poor condition. Population, we used um, population estimates from the ONS. And then we used our variability index that I've just talked about. So we tested our, um, our, our, DA, our, our model, first of all, using principal components analysis. Because what we were saying is we've got these different dimensions and we're, we're, we're saying that the different separate aspects of rural deprivation. So we wanted to check that um, any indicators within each dimension were related to each other or correlated with each, each other and less well correlated with the other dimensions. So on testing that, we found out that the, um, well, three of the dimensions uh, were quite good. One of them, spatial scale was possibly not a distinct um, as, um, dimension, separate dimension of rural deprivation, so we removed it, leaving us with the three dimensions. We then did a number of different weightings. We tried 22 different weightings, and we correlated the findings with six comparison variables. Um, three of these, I think, were from the census. They included education, um, income, health, um, we also looked at uptake of um, health-related benefits and a couple of age-standardized health um, variables. We then selected the RDI that was best correlated with these comparison variables, um, or better correlated than the IMD. That also had at least one additional LSOA in rural village and dispersed um, in the most deprived quintile. Um, so th the next two slides are the resulting maps. Um, the first slide shows um, the, maps for the, the map for the IMD um, in quintiles of deprivation, where the darkest color is the most deprived quintile. You won't see many um, dark uh, quintiles or LSOAs because they're in urban areas, and LS urban LSOAs are small, so um, they're hard to see on a map like this. Um, if we go to the RDI, which is the new measure for rural deprivation, you'll see um, a lot more um, LSOAs in the most deprived quintile. A lot of these are the small rural towns uh, that I talked about earlier. You can see quite a lot along the coast. Um, we fed these findings back. Um, we worked with a consultative, a consultative group um, set up by Public Health England, and which included directors of public health um, from various rural counties in the east of England. Um, the director of public health for Norfolk said that um, I, there are a number of counties to the, um, to the west here um, that are in the most deprived um, quintile. And in that area, they'd noticed higher uptake of public health services than they expected um, using the IMD. So um, there's a sort of uh, validation. So finally, um, what are the take homes from this work? Well, the RDI provides a structure to group discrete sets of correlated variables that represent different dimensions of deprivation and to weight them. It could be used for other purposes. So for example, it could be used for urban deprivation. 
Um, you can think about other, other um, geographic characteristics, such as proximity to a large town, which affects um, deprivation um, as well. The variability indicator developed for the research um, might provide a simple tool for identifying heterogeneity of deprivation. The surprising finding was um, this, this research really, and a lot of our decisions were made um, with relation to rural village and dispersed, um, which is um, how we envisaged rural deprivation, if you like. But it, in the end, it was actually rural, town, rural towns um, and fringe that um, ended up becoming, having the biggest change, if you like, using the, ID, IMD, the RDI instead of the IMD particularly um, rural town and fringe in, in sparse settings, so the more isolated small rural towns. Um, but a final caveat, um, all of these ind indices, um, I would say including the indices of deprivation, uh, multiple deprivation, there's a level of subject subjectivity. There are lots of decisions to make about what indicators to include um, and how to weight them. So there's no gold standard in any of them. Thank you. Okay, so for the third talk in this session, I'm going to present some of the more recent work that we've done, particularly working with Essex County Council to take our green infrastructure analyses, methodologies a little bit further forward. This is work done with one of our researchers, Gilla Zunenberg, who's sitting in the audience. We also have demonstrations of some of the outputs from this work on the computers available in the lounge. So if you want to look at them later on this afternoon in the drinks reception, you can. So you can see that we've done a number of studies looking at different sorts of ways of defining green infrastructure. Last year, we had another discussion with Essex County Council and some of the people like Jane Rogers in the audience about the challenges that Essex was going to face in the future. Essex is one of the counties in England which is facing very considerable population expansion. Population is predicted to increase by over 15% by 2039. That's going to be increased from 1.8 million to about 2.1 million. That rate of increase is rather higher than the national average for England, which is about 10%. And there are individual local authorities within Essex where the projected rate of population increase is something like 20%, with very substantial new developments of garden, garden suburbs or similar sorts of communities. So one of the things that Essex County Council is working on at the moment is developing a green infrastructure strategy to meet a number of different sorts of objectives. So they want to try and identify where their different sorts of green infrastructure assets are currently, what sorts of functions those assets, those types of green infrastructure serve, and the sorts of benefits that flow from those functions. Then we want to sort of take that database and use it to try and assess the implications of proposed new developments, particularly these large new housing and employment related developments in different parts of the county. And then lastly, by linking those two sets of data together, look at where, for example, there might be need for additional green infrastructure provision of certain types, and what opportunities there might be as part of, say, large residential or employment projects to enhance the green infrastructure provision in different areas. So basically, we have used the need for the County Council to try and develop this green infrastructure strategy to take some of what we've learned from the earlier work that Amy described and apply it in a different context. We're still part way through that work. It won't be finished until next March. But what I can give you now is a sense of how we're approaching it 
and some of the sorts of initial outputs that are coming from it. So we have a methodology to try and produce an initial set of green infrastructure assets, functions, and benefits. Because of the variations in definition that Amy has identified and described to you, we've taken the approach that we're going to try and overlay and merge as many different data sets as possible to produce a very broad brush green infrastructure definition. We're not trying to focus purely on publicly accessible green infrastructure. So the approach that we've taken is to start with the blended data set that Amy has described to you, because this is, this is a good starting point. But then we've combined that with data on other sorts of assets, other types of natural capital, if you like, that also represent different dimensions of green infrastructure. So that includes things, for example, like different types of nature reserves, country parks, and the Ordnance Survey Open Green Space product. We've merged those different sets of data together. Something that's been published earlier this year is a new classification of habitats in the UK, something called UK Hab. It has a series of green infrastructure categories within it. So to make this approach as standardized as possible, we've classified all the different sites that are resulting from this into those UK HAB categories. That gives us a set of assets. What we then need to do is we need to try and assess the functions and benefits associated with those assets. We've done that in a relatively simple sort of way by using other work on green infrastructure mapping, particularly that carried out in the northwest of England, the area around Liverpool. And we've developed a series of matrices where you have the different types of assets, or the different categories of feature, and then the sorts of functions that they provide. So where you have a little cross in the matrix, it's like saying, this type of asset provides this function. And then you can do the same thing again and take those 10 types of function and relate them to 20 different categories of benefit. And that then allows us, for instance, to take the asset map and generate maps of where different functions are occurring or where different benefits are being provided. The follow-on from phase from that is to take lots of very diverse information from local plans of local authorities in Essex and combine it into a single spatial database in a GIS of major development sites and then relate those development sites to the GI database and other types of socioeconomic information to be able to evaluate the different sorts of implications for green infrastructure provision. How does the provision vary across the county? Where might there be needs for additional provision in different locations? What opportunities might exist linked to the sorts of developments that are either going on now or might take place in the future in the county. So what do we get from that? Well, we got a lot of very large, very detailed, and very complicated maps. This is just the overview map of the whole of Essex. To really appreciate the detail, you need to sort of actually sort of sit in front of the screen and zoom in on areas. But I can give you a few figures that will give you a sense of it. So, the input data layers that went into this, they came from about 20 different sources, and they together sort of separately cover about 160,000 hectares of land. But there's quite a lot of overlap between some of those different sources. So when you overlay everything, you're actually down to about 90,000 hectares of green infrastructure spread all across the county. <coughs> 
And of that green infrastructure, about 38% is natural and semi-natural open space, and 24% is productive spaces. That's across the county as a whole. If you go into the more urban areas, it's categories like parks and gardens and sports facilities that are proportionally more important. If you want to think about it in percentage terms, about 24% of Essex is classified as some form of green infrastructure. But keep in mind that's a very broad definition of green infrastructure. There was a study carried out in 2009 for Essex of what was termed a publicly accessible green infrastructure, and that came up with a total of 5%. So there's a big difference in how much green infrastructure you have according to the types that you consider and how you define it. But we could separate out those separate categories from within this. So we can look at it in terms of spatial features like that. Here, it's possibly a little bit hard to see on the slide. This is all the public rights of way and cycle paths in Essex. So there's about two and a half thousand hectares associated with those different sorts of features and particular promoted paths, longer distant paths in certain types of the county. We can also look at how those sorts of patterns vary on a proportional basis. So here we have choropleth maps where the different local authorities in Essex are shaded in according to in the left-hand map, as you're looking at it, the percentage of green infrastructure. And the most obvious feature of this map is that those percentages tend to be a little bit higher in the southern parts of the county. But some of that is because in the northern areas in particular, there's rather more in the way of agricultural land. So what we've done here is we've used the agricultural land classification and we've identified those areas of agricultural land that are not classed as green infrastructure, and we've mapped those in these areas. So districts like Uttlesford, Brainsford, Trend, Trend, Tendering, and so forth, they, are, they score a bit lower on this, but they have much more open agricultural land compared to, for instance, the local authorities closer to London. And we can then also look at the same kind of pattern with public rights of way. So actually, it's some of the areas like Uttlesford that are, are quite good in terms of those public rights of way spread across the agricultural land. And there's fewer of some of those parts, types of paths in some of the authorities in the southeast of the county. We can also look at the functions and we can look at the benefits. These maps get very multicolored and very detailed very quickly. So I've just got one example here, something for the whole of the county, and then just some, something zooming in to the local authority of Harlow. The most important point to highlight here is just how multifunctional much of that green infrastructure is. So the sorts of areas that are coming up with the blues and then to the higher end of the scale, this is where you've got types of green infrastructure meeting multiple functions. And you can see how it varies both across the county, but also within individual urban areas. And what we're starting to do now is begin to look at the associations between those data and proximity to different parts of the county. So Natural England, a number of years ago, developed a, a set of standards for public access to green infrastructure. And they did that by taking different sizes of sites, so bigger than two hectares, bigger than 20 hectares, bigger than 50 hectares, bigger than 500 hectares, and so forth, and saying populations should be within a certain distance of those types of sites. So that, for instance, if uh, the, the standard says that you should have an air, a two-hectare area of green infrastructure within 300 metres, right? whereas with some of the other features, the buffer sizes are much, much larger. What we've done here, just as an example, 
is we've taken the local authority of Malden in eastern Essex. We've defined a 10-kilometer corridor around it. And then on each of the maps, we've calculated the area, which is more than the natural England specified distance from green infrastructure at sites of different sizes. So the smallest one here through to the largest one here. The areas in the yellowish color are the areas on each map which are outside the kind of targeted buffer distance. So this area on the western side of Malden, these areas here, relatively few areas for that standard and a little bit more. One of the interesting things about these maps is actually they're, they're quite different in their pattern. So it's also not just a matter of what type of green infrastructure you've got, but sometimes what the size of the site is. But very interesting, if you, if you actually overlaid all those maps together, there's no place there would be no access on all four of those criteria. Because, for instance, the area that's not covered here is covered very well, for example, on that sort of map and so forth. Perhaps the most interesting map is this one, which is picking out the more micro-scale variation. And we're now starting to use that to look at the effects of individual development sites. So here we've zoomed in a little bit more on the area around the towns of Malden and Haybridge. So these have populations at the moment together of about 23,000 people. But there are now uh, agreed plans in the local plan to build two new large garden suburbs to the north and south, one to the south of Malden and the north of Haybridge. As they're gradually developed, that's going to bring about 6,000 new residents into the area. So it's going to be an appreciable increase in population. So it's quite interesting to see, well, where are those developments relative to the existing green infrastructure and the yellow areas which are currently outside, for example, that 300-metre buffer? And what might be the effect if, for example, these new developments were to remove green infrastructure that was actually present? So what we've been starting to do is both define the boundaries of these areas and then find out more about them. So these are scanned maps on the right-hand side from the master plans for these new garden suburbs. And actually, in these cases, the developers have very clearly incorporated the existing green infrastructure into those particular settlement plans. So this area... Here, for example, corresponds to that band there. This area there corresponds to that area there, and so forth. So in this case, there is actually potential for these sorts of developments to actually enhance the green infrastructure in this particular region of Essex. The important thing will be to repeat that kind of analysis across the county and see what the implications are in different places. So to conclude, I think what we've got here is an approach where we can examine the green infrastructure provision at a very high level of spatial detail. We can look at it in terms of supported functions and benefits. And the approach that we've got here is using publicly available data, with the exception of the local development sites. Everything that's going into the green infrastructure map, you could map for anywhere else in England. So the kind of approach that we've got here is inherently transferable. And the next step, so we've got to start to look at associations with socioeconomic variables something that's going to be a little bit similar to some of the analyses that Amy described. We've got to complete the mapping of the potential development sites. And then we've got to undertake further spatial analyses using GIS techniques to look at where some of the different sorts of strategic needs and opportunities are and what it might be possible to do 
to enhance green infrastructure provision across the county. So I'll finish on that point, but I'd just like to finish with a very genuine acknowledgement to some of the staff at Essex County Council, Jane Rogers, Paul Hinsley, Alex Bodanovich, and John Meehan. They've been very helpful to us. The collaboration, I think, between what we've been able to provide in terms of the research expertise, their knowledge of the area, and the policy requirements has perhaps been very typical of what was mentioned in your talk. So thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew, for a, for a really um, excellent presentation and also to your uh, co-authors and, and, and researchers. Can I ask you, it may sound like a silly question, we've all heard that by taking walks, um, being in nature, we feel happier. So I wonder if there has been any research or you have any plans to link the sort of happiness index uh, to the areas where you have the more, let's say, green spaces or recreational spaces or spaces that have been saved so that people can walk around and can experience nature. Um, that's probably Mandy and Andy's yeah, research that, area. That's not really my area, but I, there are people in, in the team I work for who do work in that area, and I know that there is some evidence of health benefits from being in green spaces. But that's probably all I can tell you because that's not an area of my, my research. But there are there is research into that area and there are benefits, yeah. yeah. So I mean another way in which you could take some of this work, you could actually start to take a more specifically natural capital and ecosystem service approach to this. We are doing that in some ways through the kind of functions and benefits. There is work that I know Natural England are doing to define what they call ecometrics. Yeah? So one of the things that you start having to do then is instead of just saying this asset might provide this function or this benefit, you have to put some form of weighting scale on it. Right? So clearly you have a, you have a judgment issue there. The other way that you can start to do it, I would say the literature is stronger in some of these areas than others, is basically monetary valuation of different sorts of environmental assets. The area which is probably strongest of those types of things at the moment is the value of open access recreation. So if you're interested in that, there is an online web tool called Orval, O-R-V-A-L, developed by a team at the University of Exeter for DEFRA, and it allows you to cite, pick locations around the country, and it will apply a statistical model based on survey data and give you a recreational value. Right? Amy, you've worked on these kinds of things a lot as part of the National Ecosystem Assessment. Do yes. you want to say something about that? Um, yeah, so um, a lot of the the work that I've done um, prior to this has been based around monetary evaluation of ecosystem services as part of the natural national ecosystem assessment and I've worked a lot actually with that team that have been developing that online tool at Exeter um, looking at the benefits of outdoor recreation um, particularly so thinking about um, for example the placement of new recreational resources, say we're putting a new park, where do we put it? Well, we put it close to people, um, put a new, new woodland, where do we put it? Well, we, we don't dig up um, peatland, um, release lots of um, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So there's lots of other considerations um, that come into this. It's, it's um, quite a complicated um, process. Any other questions, please? Come on. Question. Yes. Um, perhaps to Amy, just I'm wondering is the implication in your conclusion that the the data from the uh, IMD that we're not giving provision of green infrastructure to those areas of deprivation, um, that, that all of the provision is going to the nice leafy suburbs where people can happily have, mm -hmm. think about places like Jaywick or um, Great Yarmouth for instance. That's a really interesting point. Um, it could be, um, or it could just be that people 
aren't as willing or able to survey in those areas. So that's what we need to, to look at as the next step, whether it's just a reflection of where that volunteer geographic information is coming from and who is able and who is willing to contribute that information, or whether it is a reflection of the amount of um, green space in those areas. And I suppose that links on to the, the rural um, vulnerability um, sort of work that um, you've also heard about today. West Sussex um, and I was interested that your um, research seemed to suggest that uh, in Norfolk you didn't particularly have a problem with um, air quality under the deprivation measures um, no. I think that was one Where, whereas in fact we found the opposite some of our market towns have got some really high levels um, of um, poor air quality <coughs> and measure differently on, on that yeah. measure it, it, when we looked overall across Norfolk um, on average, um, rural, rural areas um, were less affected by air quality issues, but that's not to say that there weren't um, uh, areas that did, do have that, that problem. And uh, the other thing is that our main, um, the main way we were judging that was on rural, rural villages. So that was the main um, driver for the decisions we made in our work. So that's where it would have been looked at um, rather than sort of small towns. Any other questions? Yes, please. Just going back to your question about the voluntary geographic information that people provide, what would you like people to provide across, say, Norfolk as, a, as an example, and how would you collect that information together, and how would you actually get them inspired to do that in the first place? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a big question. Um, I don't know. I'm going to defer to Andrew for this one. No, that's, that's, that's good of you. <laughs> Um, I, think the, I think the technology has made it much more possible to do these kinds of things than it was a few years ago, right? I think we, you know, in, in some ways we almost need to start engaging with, for instance, schools and community groups in these sorts of areas, perhaps more than we currently do. Um, I'm very reminded, um, this is going back a very long time, um, some of you may have heard of something called the Land Utilisation Survey of Britain that was done in the 1930s by a person called Dudley Stamp, who was a professor of geography at the LSE. But it was, it's a national map of land use in Britain in the 1930s. It was done by basically engaging secondary school geography teachers who went out with their pupils for part of their geography field work and mapped the land use in their surrounding areas and was then pieced together. I think perhaps you know, we need to think about if we can work with the Geographical Association or one of those other organisations to start to try and do more of these kinds of community initiatives. People can, you know, the experience of working with the OpenStreetMap data shows you how powerful that can be in terms of the detail that it provides. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges of working with it at the moment is that the coverage can be so inconsistent. So, well, that's, that's an idea, at least. <laughs> another question? Yes, please. Um, with improvements in things like satellite light technology and machine learning, um, do you see a sort of scope for actually taking and processing data from satellite imagery to give you more automated classification of um, sort of green space infrastructure um, on a rapid turnaround, really? Yes, because there's things in the uh, European Union Copernicus program, particularly the Sentinel satellites, they are giving you a much shorter return period between visits than was the case with something like the American Landsat satellites. But not only are they giving you, you know, much more frequent imagery, as well as the multispectral imagery which would allow you to distinguish types of land cover, you can now link that to the radar information which is giving you the height of the information. So that imagery is now allowing, for instance, agencies to produce crop maps rather than land cover maps. So we have something called the Crop Map of England, which has only been available in the last two years, which actually maps the distribution of individual crops. 
and I can see the potential for starting to take that data and you're going to have three-dimensional landscape information. And that's where you would start to get towards those sorts of things. I can see that happening. Okay. Well, in that case, can I draw this session to a close and we can move on to the, the next session of panel discussion? But can you please thank the speakers?